It's been nearly two years since Army Major Nidal Hassan opened fire on the Fort Hood military base, killing 13 people. It was the biggest terrorist attack on American soil since 9-11, and it left Hassan's family searching for answers. A new Pew study shows that nearly half of American Muslims think that Muslim leaders in the United States haven't done enough to speak out against Islamic extremists. It's one of the reasons that Hassan's family is now breaking its silence. And ABC's Bob Woodruff spoke exclusively with them, and he joins me now. Fascinating, Very Bob. Very fascinating, Christiane. And so Natter actually decided to talk about his cousin Nadal because he deeply believes the influence of extremists turned him into a different person. Natter never imagined Imagine his cousin would be accused of murder, and Natter is doing all he can to make sure something like this never happens again. What's been the impact on your family and you? Devastation. I mean, clearly condemnation. I mean, from the beginning, uh, I think the shock, the pause, the you're you're just unable to believe. You still have to keep asking yourself and pinching yourself: Is this really what happened? On a sunny afternoon in November 2009, Natter's cousin, Major Nadal Hassan, opened fire on his Fort Hood Army colleagues who were preparing to deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. Over 100 shots fired in 10 minutes. On the phone with us, Nader Hassan, who is a cousin of the shooting suspect. And as I'm on the phone, I'm staring at the TV and now seeing some of these images come up. And uh, just, I think more than anything, I was just talking to myself saying, wait, this can't be him. He was the last person any of us would have thought. He was never violent, ever. He wouldn't kill a bug in the house. When do you think he changed? I don't know. This is a very different person than the one you describe. Doesn't, doesn't make it any better. I mean, he did what he did now, and, uh, and we've lost him. The image of a deranged shooter is a long way from the childhood Nader remembers with Nadal growing up together in suburban Virginia. Two kids growing up in Arlington County at the local fire department, meeting their firemen, putting on the firemen's hats on their heads, and thinking that they were on top of the world. Natter says they had the typical American upbringing, from birthday parties to Santa at Christmas. Graduations were family occasions. Nadal, there on the left, celebrated with Natter. They didn't speak Arabic and weren't very religious. Was Nadal religious, more religious than you? No, not or at all. the same? Same. Same thing. Kid, play soccer, catch butter, catch fireflies. You know, and uh, no, we were never, he would, we would fast, that was a big thing. Nadal had joined the army out of high school and turned to religion after the death of his mother in early 2001. That was his mom's wish, no God. And so he started praying more and becoming more pious. And then all of a sudden, four months later, September 11th happens, and now that you might see that as your first challenge as to how much do you believe in your faith? Who knows what was going on in his head? As an army psychiatrist, Nadal was assigned to Walter Reed Hospital to counsel returning combat soldiers. His family says their traumatic stories deeply affected him. And as he became more religious, he began to question the war on terror as a war on his faith, dreading his own deployment. He even gave a PowerPoint presentation to military colleagues, which seemed to solidify his evolution of beliefs he wrote, it's getting harder and harder for Muslims in the service to morally justify being in a military that seems constantly engaged against fellow Muslims. There was this issue of choosing God and country. And I think that's where his sickness really started to morph. Do you think that uh, Al-Qaeda terrorists is the ones that influenced to the point where he was ready to commit murder? I don't know. I believe that maybe some of the things that are seen on the Internet some of the websites. Um, I'm still not privy to any of the, the alleged you know, emails between uh, him and, and Anwar al-Awlaki. It is believed Nadal exchanged emails with al-Awlaki, the suspected al-Qaeda terrorist in Yemen, reportedly writing to him, I can't wait to join you in the afterlife, and asking, when is jihad appropriate? Yeah, the Senate investigation called this the ticking time bomb. I guess, potentially more violent as, as time moved on. You saw nothing like that? Nope. If you had known what was possibly going to happen, would you have turned him in? Absolutely. Without question. Without question. That's why we had the FBI come to our house right away. If there was anybody else out there that we could help. 
Nadal was shot three times during the shooting rampage and is now paralyzed from the chest down. He has since been charged with 13 counts of premeditated murder and 32 counts of attempted murder and could face death for these crimes. Do you think he should get the death penalty? I don't believe in death penalty. Um, that's going to be left up to the jury. Should this be temporary insanity? He committed a crime. I don't think there's any question as to who the shooter was. Um, and the question is still why, and that's he'll get his day in court and he'll be tried by a jury of his peers and uh, they'll make the ultimate determination. Some of the Fort Hood families who attended Nadal's preliminary hearing said he showed no signs of remorse. Would you apologize at all? For what, for what your cousin did? That's not my place. I mean, clearly I apologize for what's happened to them. I mean, I apologize to anybody, whether my cousin was involved or not. I'm sorry for that happening. Um, but that's what our family wants. Our family wishes our cousin would come back, accept responsibility, show remorse, try to turn this into a positive thing. So Natter is taking it into his own hands, a positive step by starting the Nawal Foundation, whose primary message is one of nonviolence. His all-American upbringing all American instilling in him the belief you can be both devoutly Muslim and defiantly patriotic. It's almost two years now since uh, my cousin, I believe, was stolen from, you know, stolen by some psychotic combination of whatever might have happened, but we lost him. The Nidal that we knew before Fort Hood is not the Nidal um, from Fort Hood forward. And so uh, how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Why are you doing this now? As one of the uh, agents um, that I work with in, in my business said, the silence is deafening um, from the moderate voice. I think the terrorists really have an effective poison that they're putting out there. The terrorists are trying to make it an issue, a false choice of choosing God over country. You can be fully Muslim, and you can be fully American, and there's no conflict. Do you have any desire to talk to some of the family members? If they'd want to talk to me. I do know that um, they're good people, and uh, they've been in our prayers. If you did talk to them, what would you say? God bless you. God bless the ones you lost or been harmed. And God bless our country to get through this. Now, Nader Hassan hopes the foundation named for his mother can give voice to moderates and be a force for change against radicalism. Bob, thank you so much. So valuable and such blunt commentary from the cousin. Very blunt.